Good morning, and welcome to Art Basel Conversations. This year we have a full program of exciting panels, including major museum directors, architects, curators, critics, and collectors. But we always like to start Art Basel Conversations with an artist talk, because without artists, Art Basel could not exist. This year, we are honored to welcome Paul McCarthy, a true legend, both as an artist and as a teacher for several decades. And as his sparring partner, we have Massimiliano Gioni, the new museum curator who also directs the Fondazione Trussardi and will direct the next Huangzhou Biennial. But I know you did not, up get, did not get up early to see me speak, <laughs> so I'll let Max and Paul start their conversation. Thank you for coming, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. I don't know if you hear me. We have these uh, machines. They make me feel like an actor in one of your movies, Paul. No? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just say a couple of words about Paul, and then we let him speak. Um, you know, this morning I used this wonderful website that it's called Googleism that gives you a synthesis of all the Google pages you find about a person. <laughs> and I put in Paul McCarthy, and I'm going to read you a list of what uh, came up. He says, Paul McCarthy is probably the most well-known performance artist in the world. <laughs> Paul McCarthy is an artist of extraordinary gentleness whose work deals exclusively in human degradation. Paul McCarthy is a seminal West Coast artist. Paul McCarthy is known for his raw. Paul McCarthy is a disturbed man. <laughs> Paul McCarthy is a Californian artist whose work exposes the dark side of the American dream. Paul McCarthy is Willy Wonka, which I really like. Paul McCarthy is especially good. Paul McCarthy loves ketchup. Paul McCarthy is terrific. I think I share all these views. I also have to say, and this is a personal note, that um, I'm very attached to Paul and his work because I saw two shows in 1993 when I was 20 that literally changed my life. And one was Posthuman, in which his work was uh, Central in uh, Castello di Rivoli, and uh, also at the Venice Biennale in 1993, he had two amazing pieces uh, at the Aperto. And around that time, also Heidi started circulating through some pirates uh, VHS. <laughs> and uh, uh, literally, after I've seen Heidi, I didn't feel quite the same. And uh, I started learning Paul's dialogues by heart, so to the point that now I can recite a couple of <laughs> lines from his movies, like, no, Peter, no, give the ball back to Heidi. <laughs> or, uh, daddy come home from work today, daddy come home from work. The great thing about meeting Paul is like meeting a star, but of a very subterranean world, and um, so I think today you'll enjoy a glimpse of this world through his own words, which are always much more um, complex than people assume. You know, people, I think, think you are some sort of crazy expressionist, mm. but I think um, there is a lot more behind that image. What do you think? Um. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> So let's start from something practical. Um, Paul recently opened a show in Milan um, at the Trussardi Foundation where I work, where uh, he has shown this incredible piece that is called Pig Island. Uh, Pig Island, of which you'll see some images running by, um, is a thing. I don't really know if it's a sculpture or an environment or an object. I think one of the best descriptions is a matrix, you call uh -huh. it. It's an object that is 100 square meters large and contains hundreds and hundreds of sculptures, objects, uh, debris, wastes, and uh, maybe we can start from there. What is Pig Island exactly? Um, <clears throat> well, it, it sort of started, um, I, I don't know. I mean, it had uh, maybe the seeds of it are probably 10 years old, but I had. I was making a videotape uh, with my son um, that was uh, based on Pirates of the Caribbean and um, the ride at Disneyland. And in the ride at Disneyland, there's a, uh, a, a, a kind of uh, little vignette as, you, as the car that people ride in goes up the hill 
there's a little vignette of uh, a pirate which seems to be intoxicated, sort of laying there with the pigs on him. And one pig's on his leg, and one pig's kind of at his side, and they're little piggies. And uh, uh, he's sort of fondly looking at the pigs, and the pigs are looking at him. And um, it was this sort of, this sort of strangely under, underlying kind of perversity to this Disney thing. And, um, I, uh, at one point, uh, after seeing that, uh, we, we, we actually video, we filmed in uh, Disneyland a lot and made movies in, inside the ride. And at one point, I'm kind of looking at this thing and I thought, oh, this idea of like pirates uh, kind of marooned on an island with nothing but pigs. And, the relationship uh, starts forming between these three or four pirates and, uh, and pigs. And uh, you end up with this island of men and pigs and men pigs. And, and then I thought, oh, I'll make it into a mechanical island like uh, with robotic pigs and robotic pirates. and. Uh, I'll make a real island, or I mean a fake island, but, and you'd walk around it, and this whole thing of looking in on it, and, and uh, it would be in these uh, rubber mechanized pirates. And um, so I made a few maquettes of it, and it was, at the time I was doing other pieces, and then I decided it was time to make the big piece, and um, I had gotten, all these big foam, white foam blocks to carve an island and eventually start making a mechanized uh, sculpture that was about 40 feet by 40 feet. And then what happened is, is I put the blocks on the, in the middle of the studio and gridded it off to make the island and then realized that I wasn't interested in making a mechanical uh, island and uh, I wasn't interested in carving the white foam. So I put plywood up on top of the white blocks and uh, then for uh, seven years or so uh, I made sculpture up on the blocks. And so it went from like making a sculpture to making a kind of pedestal that was a, a bit of a theater inside the studio. And um, there were three of us that sort of worked up there every day for about five years or off and on. I would leave, they would come back. And then it, it, over the seven years, it, the piece just completely piled with, uh, it wasn't, in a way, it, it wasn't the residue of making the sculpture. I, I really was interested in this process going and then f kind of paying attention or looking at, the, at what was occurring over the five years as, uh, as uh, making an object, not that I was exposing my studio, but, or making, uh, you know, allowing the, it was like I was making an object through a process, through sc making sculpture being the performance, or In making ways. sculpture, and then a type of performance that is not visible to a public, in a sense. Uh, it was rarely videotaped and rarely photographed. And, uh, and then at one point after several years, the, I couldn't exactly discern where the piece stopped and where the studio ended. And, and then I started seeing parts of the studio metaphorically, like uh, there was a big curtain and I started thinking of that as the void and uh, that this island was at the edge of a void. And, um, and then at, 
sort of came to a point where I started thinking of making it two stories and going up, and that I was going to construct a type of heaven above it. And, um, and so then the bottom part that had gone on for so many years ceased to be interesting, and I'd moved on to this penthouse area, which was all about drinking tequila and, and being in a mirrored room and um, climbing a staircase to a kind of heaven. And, then, um, and the bottom part, I stopped working on and nobody was on it. And then it turned into not making a sculpture, but moving a sculpture. And I moved it to another building, which was all about giving it to somebody else who would move it. And I gave it to these three guys to move. And, um, and that and I wasn't working on it anymore, they were moving it. And which they couldn't, like the instructions were, nothing is to change position. And I knew that I wouldn't do that. If I moved it, it was going to change. But if I gave it to somebody else who believed in that, that that shouldn't change. And the moving is a major operation. You know, I, yeah. I don't know if you caught some glimpses of the sculpture of this thing. Um, to give you an idea, it requires, I think, five containers. Um, yeah. And uh, it's been recorded in 24 gigabytes of photographs. And to reconstruct it, basically, there are three people that, as in an archaeological dig, yeah. they recompose it systematically. It takes uh, three to four weeks to build it and three to four weeks to dismantle it. Um, what I particularly like about this piece is what you were saying, that you couldn't tell where the studio ended and where the sculpture began mm -hmm. and um, of course when you were installing the piece and when you were talking about it it made me think a lot of two artists that I think are very crucial for your work who are Alan Kaprov and Dieter Roth I think mm -hmm. this is particularly probably your closest piece to Dieter Roth in its um, continuous uh, yeah. deconstruction or um, you know I recently in Berlin they reinstalled the the garden sculpture of Dieter Roth and I think there are many similarities in the piece also in the way that both the garden sculpture and Pig Island, they look like giant boats. They look yeah. like um, rafts, in a way. So I don't know if you want to talk about maybe also your relationship with Alan that was um, quite direct and personal, no? Um, yeah. Uh, I think with, maybe I can talk about sure. each of them. I mean, I, with Dieter wrote it, in, in Los Angeles, it was really hard to see anything of Diderot. Um, there was a famous piece that, uh, at least in the, in the confines of California, or Southern California, the Diderot piece, which was the cheese in a suitcase, um, which I don't think is very well known, maybe in uh, Europe or in New York or anywhere, but in LA history, I think it's somewhat significant at least significant to artists. And I never saw the piece. Uh, I arrived in LA uh, about the summer it was done, but uh, didn't see it. And had real no, really no idea of what it even looked like uh, for years. Um, but I think uh, it's, you know, at that period, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, uh, Dieter wrote, uh, uh, Joseph Boys and Vostel were all kind of, uh, and especially Joseph Boys, were all really influential to uh, American artists of uh, my generation, which would be in the in their 20s at that time. And um, so, seeing Dieter Roth's work was not easy, even up until you until you even hit the 80s and 90s in California. So in a way, I didn't really know. I knew a few things, saw some books, uh, but didn't actually know of uh, the constructions, and especially the pieces that you're describing. But um, what, for me, early on, I was making 
pieces that involve uh, using simple uh, wood, like uh, two by fours or one by twos or plywood. And I, I uh, was for a long time made a living while I was making art in construction. So uh, there was something natural from even in the 60s of using wood. And um, then later when I saw Diderot's work more, there was this aspect of wood and construction. And, and um, a, at the time of, a, there was a, a correlation of maybe some sort. I was interested in sea captains and boats, uh, mostly with the idea of entering the void that somehow like a boat going, I mean, it's very, in one way, a cliched image of a boat and the sea and the void and, and this idea of uh, a captain or uh, a, and then the, f so there was a connection with boats and void and uh, then I think a coincidence in a way of the, the two large boats. Uh, and then this piece, Pig Island, you know, it went from an island to referring, I called it for a while the Raft of the Medusa because it began to feel more like a raft than a boat and, uh, or than an island. And, uh, but I, I think uh, in one way being hugely influenced by Diderot and another way not seeing the work and uh, some of the imagery being quite coincidental. Did you meet him ever? Or? No. no? Uh -uh. And with Alan Capro, he was a more direct... Well, Capro, I, Capro was significant, I think, to LA art in the early 70s in a, in a pretty... Because Capro comes to LA, leaves New York, he goes to San Francisco, then comes to LA in 1967 or 68, and is uh, one of the main directors behind CalArts, and then CalArts being a super influential school, uh, especially between 68, 9, and early 70s. And I, and I think uh, his presence in LA, uh, LA not being a, a city that Although there's galleries, and it certainly has a, an art scene in terms of galleries, at that time it was, uh, there was a lot of performance being made, I think because there wasn't as strong a gallery scene, and also the influence of Capro and uh, his presence just in the city was, I think, pretty important, you know. What do you think, um, I mean, when you moved to L.A., um, you were doing already performances. Right? Uh -huh. How do you think your own work stood out or related to what was going on there? For me, the most um, symbolic element of your work that distinguished from anybody else was the idea that you put on a mask, that I think it's a huge uh, sort of divide from what was going on with performance before you and in a way after you. You know, there, there is before you, there is the sort of naked, expressionistic performance and then uh, you start your performance that is masks and so suddenly it's not about the truth it's about a character and um, and a fiction and uh, in a way that mask immediately connects you to Disneyland to to Hollywood and with that simple gesture I think there is a big fracture happening but what was your um, the way you would place your own work in relation to that community, if you did at all, and how would you distinguish your own work from? I, <clears throat> I think I, uh, the minimalism or the, the objects that I made in the late 60s, uh, both in film and in sculpture, but and, and they were a type of, you know, a, a minimalism influenced by, you know, the minimalism of the time. But it, it, I never made a cross into. Uh, I, I always referred to the minimalism in terms of the body, and that it was always about minimalism for me was always about uh, a, a skin 
with an interior, and that uh, Donald Judd or the Tony Smith, although the essence was this object, it was always encasing uh, an interior, and the interior was always some sort of void. And, um, and I was always interested in that I couldn't access the void of the interior of minimalism. Like that was, what was critical was not the shape, but that it contained a void. And then, so the pieces I was making at the time were always about indicating that there was something inside. And um, that there was an interior you couldn't access. So the sculptures at that time might be a cube, but it would have a, a tail coming off that indicated that some, you, you could, inside, inside that thing was a, an interior. And I referred to the cubes as skulls. So I, I would refer to the, the like a, a cube as a skull, and other forms were referred to the body. And then I hadn't, really made, I made a couple of pieces indicating a mask. One was just a piece of cardboard with two holes in it, and the, it hung from a string, and it was sort of the first real break out of the minimalism into a performative object, in that the viewer could stand at either side and look out these holes. But what it was to make reference to, or to be poignant about, is that I was obsessed with the fact that I look out of two holes in my head, and that I forget the skin or the skull disappears, uh, and it's, it's, so there was this thing about the structure of the face and, and looking out of holes, and so the piece was about somehow referencing the skull. And then I, I was going to do a performance in the 70s, and it was the first time that I did a performance using liquid in an actual videotape, and I suggested to the cameraman that he doesn't show my head. So it's just from here down. And then the next performance I did, which was several weeks after that, I taped my head up, so I covered my head. And then I realized that all the actions that involve liquid also involve covering the head. And then it, it wasn't until, uh, I think, early, uh, uh, mid-70s, that I begin to use masks. Okay. And it, there is two things going on. One is the, the, the image of the mask, and all the masks were just bought at thrift at uh, uh, toy or these gag stores, these Halloween stores. And so the masks are usually of whoever is popular at the time, whether it's Madonna or Carter or, you know, whoever's the latest thing. And it was just choices made, like, like or a ready-made. I just go in and pick one. And, but quickly, by putting on the mask, I created another architecture. So, the mask served different purposes, but one was that it, by putting it on, I encased my head, made an architecture, and referenced the interior, or referenced my interior by my interior being inside the mask. And it also changes the sound. And uh, so, um, it, it, although it, one way, an intuitive act uh, to use a mask, in another way, uh, for me, directly uh, uh, existential. Like, uh, it was a way of isolating and uh, isolating myself. Are the performance scripted, or especially the these first ones, and, and were they always conceived for a camera? Because I think that's also another major uh, contribution or revolution of yours, that a lot of your performances are, um, in a way, televised at their own origin. They're not, I mean, some of them have happened live, but many of them are conceived just for a yeah, camera. Or, um, yeah, I think, 
in the 60s, I was really interested in experimental film and influenced by experimental film and, and, was, and, I, and, and kind of fetishized cameras. I was really into the camera itself and, uh, and um, the camera being a type of, again, a type of brain or a skull. The camera, this ca the camera itself is a skull. And um, I, there was a period where I didn't do much filming of performances when I was in San Francisco in the late 60s. It, 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 there was a whole period of not filming and the interruption of the camera to the action. And, but I moved to LA in 1970 and at that point I wanted to go to film school and the idea was is that I, I wanted to make films and make films that were performances and uh, and then it just compounded and I think that as much as the live action was important to me uh, filming or photographing it was uh, equally important and I, I and in a way I think I was I have kind of thought of at the time in LA a lot of performance artists referred to their work as sculpture performance as sculpture the body is a three-dimensional thing as a three-dimensional object as a sculpture and I think I was always more interested or something about it as the performance in painting and not just from the act of painting and uh, the action of painting but also making a picture and making a picture was using the camera and uh, so there was kind of two things so this this sort of obsession with filming and photographing the action and uh, the performance and then beginning to use to overlay that into the piece itself, the actual film image. And then when does the, the architectural part, especially the use of sets, come in? Because that's, I think, another um, one of your greatest, again, revolutions, the idea that the, this set, like in the garden or in Bossy Burger, that you appropriate yeah. actually a television set, you populate it with your people, your own characters and then uh, yeah. you make it into a sculpture. I, well, uh, the early paintings that I did, I thought of them as doors. So I would, and they, they were often painted on boards and I would say they're doors or I would say that a painting that was horizontal was a window and so there was these kind of direct references in the 60s of painting to architecture, meaning doors and windows and then and, and so there's this connection to architecture you know from the 60s and, and then the films being a lot about the early films being about architecture but then uh, when I moved to LA um, and I'm I begin to be by I think the late 70s really interested in in acquiring sets from Hollywood and um, I was working in Hollywood at the time and w w being in a sound stage the sets were I was really interested in these sets uh, this sort of uh, convoluted architecture which you go in the front door and there's no living room but you go directly out the back and and these things sort of sitting in these big black empty rooms like voids and they were always, uh, you walked around them and this thing of things being filmed inside a, a sound stage and it being reminiscent of some sort of trap that you can't leave inside a dark space. And um, so uh, the architecture or the use of sets sort of happens in the late 70s and um, uh, I think, um, I, you know, television sets are set up like this so that all the cameras look in and they're, sometimes they're even opened up like that and my whole interest was to close them back up to make them 
so you couldn't leave them. So they, they really represented a trap that once you're in, you can't get out. And uh, so it was to use sets, but always to recreate them back into a trap. And was it Bossy Burger the first or uh, the garden? Uh, no, the first use of sets happens in a videotape called um, Mother Pig, oh, yeah. which was in San Diego. And I had acquired a set. And then they took it back. I never got to keep it. And then when I did Family Tyranny and Cultural Soup, I built a set for that. So it, those are both, one's late 70s, one's uh, mid 80s. And then, but Bossy Burger's the first real full set that is kept and uh, uh, shown in a gallery. And the garden comes afterwards. That's the... the garden was an idea before Bossy Burger, but uh, and I was going to do the garden in Roseman Feltson's gallery, but uh, then the opportunity came to show it at MoCA, so I decided to put the garden in MoCA and then came up with Bossy Burger. So uh, although Bossy Burger was made before the garden, the garden is uh, six or seven months before. And you say the garden, I'm sure you remember the garden, is this um, garden or this set actually from Bonanza, right? Uh, it, the trees were on Bonanza set. And there are these mechanical men that are um, copulating with one with a tree and another with, um, with the earth. And uh, the yeah. third one, no, that's There's only two. two, two. Yeah. 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 And you said before that it relates closely to Pig Island, or in which way does it? If well, the garden, I was, it's the two men. The, the one man with the tree, which is, which is vertical, and then the other man on the ground, which is horizontal. So it's this vertical horizontal. And the one that's humping the tree is an older man, and the one that's on the ground is younger. And they, they, the, the garden's like a rectangle, and they're, so they're this way compositionally in the middle of the garden. And both of them are dressed like they're, it's lunch break and they're going off to the woods. And it's a little like the older man is instructing the younger somehow. And there's, a, uh, there's some sort of collusion, I think. I, 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 they're not aware of the outside. And then by that they're an island and they, they're busy in the inside, and then the viewer, the trees end up being like uh, uh, shields where you have to, the viewer has to look through the trees, but by looking through the trees, they have to bend. So all of a sudden the viewer becomes voyeuristic, but they're positioning themselves. And it's about, it was, at the time, I was sort of, one part of it was I was uh, watching Chicago television and there was a whole thing about that uh, Belize uh, receives uh, Chicago television. And so there were a lot of Chicago Cub fans in Belize and I thought, well, that's so fucked up. That they view in, but yet Chicago has no idea of Belize. Belize is aware of Chicago. And it's this idea of that, in a way, America was a type of island. And so then that became somewhat political, but that it maybe is a sidelight to the thing. But it, with, so the garden, in a way, is an island. And, uh, and so the concept of an island has been, I've been interested in that because it, islands are, uh, islands or walled-in cities become ways of conditioning and uh, the idea of uh, a culture being a conditioned, that we're conditioned to reality, and, uh, which I think is something I've been interested in for a long time. You, you mentioned the fact that in the garden there is an older man teaching to a younger man, and throughout your work there is uh, I mean, the figure of the patriarch and the teacher are always yeah. crucial from 
the captain of the boat, to sailors meet, to um, it's a, literally a gallery of patriarchs that yeah. you have composed. And uh, I don't know if you want to say something about, is it a conscious decision? Like you decided to explore American father figures or, or kind of deface them? Um, um, and well, are you a patriarch yourself at this point? Um, <laughs> Who's going to yeah. shoot on you? <laughs> but um, I, I think, well, the same with Pig Island. In the middle, it's, uh, there's me in the middle of Pig Island. And then I'm wearing the head of Bush. And so the mask, because I wear the mask of Bush. So it's often in pieces, the body's me and the head is the mask of a patriarch. But the patriarch, at one point, you know, in, the, in this sort of evolution of pieces I've made, it's kind of, it went from a series of pieces in which it, it's me, me as a female seemed to be something that appeared over and over again in the 60s. Then it went to, the, to animals, and I kept wearing the masks of animals. Then it started into patriarchs. And the patriarch went on for a while. It was a sea captain, grandfather, presidents, you know, Carter, uh, Arafat, like. And, and then it went to cartoon characters like Popeye and a patriarch, but then to olive oil. And uh, then it went to Heidi and then, you know, Pinocchio and, and Sodden Soddy Sock, Saddy Sack. And uh, then Santa Claus, a patriarch. And uh, then the theme went to cowboys and and now, you know, Snow White. And so, yeah, the patriarch comes and goes. And uh, I, I don't know whether sometimes it's, yeah, I'm interested in dethroning the patriarch in a way, and that includes myself, but it, it's also uh, not just the patriarch, but uh, I, I, I'm kind of right now really interested in the, the personality that the, the intangible personality, which is like uh, Bush or Mickey Mouse or uh, Bin Laden or Angelie Jolie, like somehow they're the intouchable. And they, uh, so something about that, that uh, and that includes, you know, the cartoon figure of Donald Duck, you know. So, or Walt Disney or whatever, yeah. you know? Uh, so, uh, yeah, George Clooney, I don't know. <laughs> Do you think your work is mostly about America or did it exist? I mean, it's interesting to see so many people here now because, and, and on many levels, your success began in Europe before then America, no? I, re I find there is a great coincidence that Flesh Art puts you on the cover in 93. And then our forum with the same photograph puts you on the cover in 2001, around the time of the new museum show, with the exact same photograph from the same piece. So it's, uh, I think yeah. you got more recognition in Europe early on, no? Was that the case? Or, um, so do you feel your work is about America or it speaks about? Well, I <clears throat> I mean, over the years, you know, the, the question that come, will come up is, oh, has California or Los Angeles influenced your work? And then I'd always say, no, not really. The reality of that is that I, I think it has. So, uh, you know, there is something about... But at the same time, I had the choice a long time ago, I could have gone to Europe or I could have gone to New York, and I specifically chose L.A. And I think it was because of uh, what L.A. is as a, a type of fantasy media world. But I think I was interested in the imagery of, uh, of uh, L.A., not the architecture, 
I don't think that's so interesting. I think the atmosphere of LA has affected a lot of artists in LA. The, the sky, the, I think uh, that's, it's there, but I, I think I was interested in, in, in kind of the, uh, the, the fucked up pleasantry <laughs> of LA. And, um, and almost I was interested in the, the sort of synthetic goo of uh, the black, the sort of dark synthetic goo of Los Angeles that I think sort of, you, I was attracted to that. And uh, so in a way, I think, yeah, my work is strongly related to America and to uh, Los Angeles. I, it's hard to know about, yeah, in a way I start showing more in, in Europe uh, as in the sense of the art world. But there was a really pretty strong alternative underground in Los Angeles and then to a degree the art world that I was part of was in Los Angeles and it, yeah my work sort of goes into an art world that we think of in this sense um, it, it, before in Europe before America but I was uh, part of something in LA that at the time felt like an art world yeah. and uh, it was an art world you know of, of uh, other artists and uh, non-profit organizations and magazines and uh, and uh, a respect for each other's work I guess you know and but you ran uh, a magazine yourself right Yeah, I ran a magazine and, you know, in a radio program and stuff like that, yeah. Was it, was your work accepted or shown much at the beginning or you had to create your own context to show it in LA? Well, I think most of the early performances were done in my own studio, so it, I mean, I, or once in a while in a school or something. Um, I don't, uh, there, there, was a, there was a couple of interesting galleries that I did pieces in, but it, uh, Europe was much more acceptable in that way to me doing performances than America was. Yeah. So Maybe before we, we ask the audience if they want to ask you something, actually, I had a question about the role of the audience in your work, because I, you, know, you went from probably performing for very small audiences live to an idea of performance and sculpture that is quite spectacular or that in any way problematized the role of the audience. And I think that's quite interesting and I don't know if you have any thought about it. Um, the way you also have appropriated techniques from the media and from cinema to, in a way, mm. to conquer the audience, no? And um, to assault it at the same time. But is that a thought that, that is important for you? Or? Um, well, I, I don't think I made very, I mean, maybe there was, I don't know, 10, 12 performances where, maybe more, I don't know, 15 performances in which a general public was invited. And of those, maybe seven or eight of them had, just coincidentally were part of some sort of performance festival or somebody knew about it in which there was a large audience and by large I mean not much bigger than this audience and but so the majority of pieces uh, were for, for small audiences and in 
a, a number, and they, and they kind of went two different ways. Some small audiences were very aware of my work, were knew me uh, in a way, uh, were open to it. Maybe not. I mean, in some cases, they just wanted to fuck with me or something during the performance in a either a friendly way or a shitty way, but at least they were aware of it. And then there were a number of performances which were done just on the street right. and uh, to an unexpecting, like an audience that had no idea what maybe I was. And, and that kind of performance of both being large and small and people who knew what it was and people who didn't exists up through the 70s and um, into the 80s. And then at, when I quit doing per live performances in the late 70s, and then it all becomes about making the video. But it was always about this thing of you, I make a video and people who come can watch the video being made, but they're on the outside. So in a way, they see themselves as watching a film or a video being made. But I was interested in that configuration where 50 people or 20 people would be there to watch a film being made because they knew it was being done. And they're a, they're a particular type of law, live audience. And then that live audience would always affect what I did. And even though it might not mean that I cross, o in that situation where I cross over and confront them in some way, but in a way their presence really affected what was happening. And I've always been interested in, or aware that that the energy of, an, of people in the room affects what you do. But now, for example, with the inflatables, you've taken it to a sort of yeah. urban scale. Is that, how does that kind of gesture relate to the audience when, uh, when you're talking to anybody in a street with a gigantic Santa with a butt plug or when uh, uh, one of your shit piles flies away from... Uh, <laughs> I, then, then I think it's about what an object does yeah. and what an object is in a, in a space and how people interact with it. And, 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 and those become, they're, they're kind of like event sculptures and you sort of place them and they, they sort of activate because they're a bit alive. They, you can bounce against them, they move, they, people know that they associate inflatables with a particular kind of, of uh, object or activity and, and uh, you know, like they end up in parks or in parking lots and uh, so in, 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 there's a slight connection to like a carnivalesque or the carnival or that and so I'm, you know, that uh, that's playing a part like in, like I'm making these big sculptures which are rides and that's about people getting in them and uh, it, it, I, like I made this big cube that spins and it's about someone being inside in a way it goes all the way back to 1969 when I was making the cubes with somebody in it, with my imagining somebody in it so those are, again, kind of carnival sculptures, like the inflatables, and, uh, but are meant for people to get inside, and it, that it's a ride, and it's uh, something that moves, and, uh, you know, it, it, it has a performance, like the object is a, has a moment where it activates. So maybe we can ask the audience if they have any question to enter the conversation. One, <laughs> one immediately. Two. Thank you very much for that uh, speech. How would you to your relation and or valuation of 
Hello. Uh, I would be very interested in your relation and or valuation or estimation of Viennese actionism and uh, most of all, of course, Otomul. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, I think uh, with, with actionism, um, I, I think I'm, I, I know of actionism maybe by the late 60s. Uh, I, I think Alan Capro had shown me something. And, uh, but saw very few images of actionism until, uh, um, the, until the early 70s, I think. And, and um, I, I think it, um, it affected me a lot. Um, but at that time, I was really, in the early 60s, I knew of Gustav Metzger. And uh, Metzger, I had sort of discovered Metzger by 65 or 66. And also Ralph Ortiz and, um, and Vostel and Capro. And then also a, a Japanese artist named Kudo. And so I, I was aware of performance and, and, uh, and was interested in, uh, in the idea of destruction in art, which was a Metzger. Uh, Metzger had done the Destruction in Art Symposium. And uh, so there was already this sort of uh, moving in this direction of, of uh, a kind of uh, an object being made through an action or um, a painting through an action or uh, and although the word performance wasn't used uh, in a way, I was, I think, the, like Kudo, it was a single person uh, making uh, like an event or a performance, like one person in the room. And I, I think uh, probably the actionists were also influenced by Klein and and maybe knew of Kudo and some of those pieces. So I see the actionist work by uh, early 70s. And I, at that time, I, not very many images, but uh, enough images to really affect what I was doing. And um, uh, in, in, a, in a way, kind of running into something that it made total sense to me in uh, uh, in the sense of, uh, not in I, I mean with mule uh, a lot of I never saw a lot of images of mule and and I didn't see the films until much later like the Kurt Krenn films in the which would have happened in the mid to late seventies but. Uh, I think, uh, in one way, uh, a, a, a real influence, and another way, um, there, it's some of the imagery is very coincidental. Like, uh, uh, I never knew that uh, that Mule used masks until way later, and um, uh, and it. I think for myself, uh, using liquids in a performance starts before I know of them. But I always thought that liquids really made something happen. And I would refer to liquids as a flux, that with the use of liquids, it then begins. And uh, I equated liquids to the subconscious. And um, that uh, is, I think, a correlation to uh, Mule, and maybe, you know, although I've never asked him, or uh, I don't know what he feels about that, you know. I mean, I've never had a conversation with him. But I would say both an influence and at the same time, just somebody that I identify with or have correlated 
And um, I, I think there are differences, though. I, I, in L.A., I never felt that art cured anything. <laughs> and I never saw myself where I think with the AAA and some of Mule's ideas that somehow we could change society. And I think that's a European village idea, that you are in a place where you can affect society. And I never believed I could change LA. And uh, so I never saw myself in any shamanistic position or any kind of healer of anything. And I never saw myself as healing myself. So in that way, we are quite different. Uh, I don't see myself as a, in a, art for me is not therapy, in the sense that I'm not getting well. <laughs> Clearly not. It, nothing, <laughs> I'm still <You're> fucked <laughs> up, but it, it, so that way it's different. And then I am, was, I think, quite influenced by uh, the, the iconic imagery of, uh, of Disneyland and that or television world and then um, and then the facade of Hollywood and so it is effective or as influential as the actionist might have been on me I think uh, the effect of uh, television and uh, Disneyland and Hollywood and this what I think uh, is the black goo or the underbelly of all that or how 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 it appears is I mean it's sort of really cliche, cliched but how it appears that everything is okay that uh, Disneyland is a, a dream world and you enter like I have this thing where you enter Disneyland and you're in a dream and they refer to it as a dream and and that you are, where in my case, I think it's a dream that is, uh, is only covering something up. And, and, and although that's very cliche, and uh, we all spout it and know it, I think in its reality, it's real. And uh, from that point of view, uh, again, it's, uh, I don't come out of Europe. It's not a village. I come out of LA, so it's a different sensibility. But uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the work of Otto Buell. You're more a symptom than a cure. No? Yeah, I'm a <laughs> symptom. I'm part of the disease. <laughs> there is another question. The, the, and actually, oh, uh, we'll do a little advertisement. But speaking of the influences of the world. The very joyful and optimistic face of your motorized pig looks like the face of Jeff Koons pig. Is it an influence? I didn't understand. It, was I influenced by Jeff Koons? <coughs> Not by Jeff Koons, but it looks like the, the face of your pig is the same face in Jeff Koons pig. Oh. It can be an influence, it's just a, a pun, you know. Yeah, the pigs look alike. All pigs look alike. <laughs> I'm afraid. I don't know. Coincidence. But you have done a work about a work Hi. by Jeff Koons. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I made a piece about Jeff Koons. So there was a question. Um, you are a great transgressor visually, as we know. Not afraid of any image, which I love. Can you keep the microphone? And um, also. Art historically speaking, you transgress any borders. Um, I don't know, shall I call you great Baroquian minimalist, the great uh, pop art expressionist or, ex or expressive pop artist? Can you tell us more about your transgressions in art? Thank you. I don't know. Uh. I think she's asking about trans. Maybe if you want to say something about trans transgressions, the ideas uh, in if, the history of art. It, I really didn't hear the question. Uh, sorry. 
I meant that you transgress, uh, transgress any perceived ideas. One cannot put you to a drawer what kind of artist you are, which I love. You are not afraid of doing things which are revolutionary in art. And can you tell us more about this? Maybe, I don't know, if you want to say <laughs> something about transgression or maybe not, I don't know. Is it, was the question about trans... Transgression, transgender. Transgender, transgender. not transgender. Transgender. Transgressing, <laughs> transgressing ideas. Transgender. No. Transgen no. Maybe Trans next question. Transgression. Transgression. <laughs> I, I couldn't hear the question at all. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Next question. Um, yeah, yeah. It's very noisy uh -huh. up here. So okay. another easy one, one. easy one. Um, I like what you said you know, about Disneyland. I was going to say it's, it's a bit like Disneyland after dark. After, after we dark, we can't hear it. Like can you hear us? No. It, no. <laughs> huh? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I said I like what you said about Disneyland in your work. I was just going to follow on and say it's it's like Disneyland after dark. It's sort of like this quirky sort of horror story that Walt Disney never really wanted to show, that you've shown. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, um, can you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, what's yep. the question? Okay, the question is, is basically the social imbalance in America today where the rich get the richer in their own sort of fantasy world and the poor get the picture where there is bread lines and the whole sort of middle class is just collapse. Do you see that very much in your work? The rich get richer, the poorer get poorer and the middle class has collapsed. Yeah. And it's all your fault. <laughs> um. No, but maybe in general is um, a banalizing question. But does your work have a political position? Um. Or should art have a political position? Should have, have a political position. I, um, well, it, yeah, um, I, you know, the question is, is that I, I, I don't know whether art should have a political position. I, I don't know because it's, it's so subjective that way. And, Artists do what they do, and they come in all kinds of uh, colors or whatever, you know. And uh, I, um, personally, I see politics enters the work. Like, uh, you know, in a way, when I made Pig Island, I wasn't going to put George Bush up on the pirate uh, having sex with a pig. I actually was going to put another head up there and then I couldn't figure out how big the head was that I was going to put up there and I had this bush head and I said I'll just put bush up there and it was really to determine scale but of course once bush was up there he never came off and you know like then I then I got into trying to sculpt bush's face and I spent I, I think I spent two years sculpting Bush's face, trying to figure out what he looks like, what his mouth was, what his eyes were. And, and it, the same with Angelie Jolie. I, I had nothing against Angelie Jolie, other than I was really interested in, that she was a celebrity, and it was about celebrity. Her status as celebrity, not her status as human being. Bush's case, I think they become way more connected Bush is who he is, and uh, I, so, but I was sculpting, I started sculpting Angelie Jolie, and then I started sculpting Bush, and I spent a year sculpting Bush, and then I put Bush back up on the pig, or back up on the guy fucking the pig, 
And then I realized I didn't want Bush there. And then I tried to, because it was too Bush, it was too much him. And then I tried to distort his face to abstract it, so I cut his nose off, thinking that in some ways I would disguise the Bush character, take him out of the piece. But then it only made, uh, it was like the act of cutting off a nose is an act of, uh, you know, at the same time that I, I cut off the nose of Bush. And then there, it was announced there was a program, a radio program, in which uh, there was a woman whose uh, uh, brother, her brother and her lover, uh, to punish her, cut off her nose and her ears. And I went, whoa, it's such a violent act to cut off the ears and the nose, and it's a punishment, like you destroyed the face. But in a way, I was distorting the face to get to an abstraction, but then it's a punishment. So the, the act of making the abstraction made a violent act, or the image of a violent act, and the, uh, uh, the, the act of punishment, Bush's punishment. And so, you know, the, it's, I, I think I'm always, like everything else, it's just filtering through. And so uh, the political content or political thinking is always inherently a part, the, the two, the, the thinking of art or the thinking of what art is and the thinking of politics and conditioning and they just get mingled together and uh, uh, they become inseparable and uh, I do I think of myself as a political artist I, I just think of myself as an artist and what I do is is often inseparable from the world I live in so there are two questions there and somebody with a microphone. Maybe we do like, a, we take two or three questions all together and then we end. Yeah, okay. Hello? Oh. Hi, can you hear me? Oh yeah, good, okay. Yeah, I got it. Um, yeah, I have got okay, a question yeah. regarding the, you, you said that the first um, time that you showed like a set from one of your, from <coughs> one of your films was a Bossy Burger. Can you hear me? Do you hear me? Okay, Bossy yeah. Burger, right? Was the first time you showed like the set of a film in a gallery? You said? I think so, yeah. And, okay, my question, sort of in follow-up, um, like the film The Painter, uh, you have these like gorgeous giant bottles, uh, tubes of paint, and actually the painting itself that you make in the film, did these objects ever enter the art market? Like, are, is that painting existing today as a, something that's traded on the market? Um, well, the... What happened these, to that painting? The, the sets of Bossy Burger and the painter, I, well, Bossy Burger I kept for, in my studio for, um, I don't know, 10, 12 years. And um, at one point, the set was sold as a whole thing. And the painter was sold as a whole sculpture. Uh, those kinds of pieces, although I've made, I don't know, seven or eight of them, the reality is, is that three or four have entered the art world and gone into uh, collections. For the most part, those big sets uh, haven't sold. It's, uh, but it does ha it's ha it's happened, yeah. They were never separated, you know, parts weren't taken out, you know. As a joke in Painter, when I did at one point, uh, when uh, the Painter at one point kind of came up Somebody inquired about the cost of the, of the piece, and I remember I said, well, it's this much for the whole piece, 
But if you buy the paintings, it's three times as much, and you don't get the rest of it. <laughs> so, um, you uh, told uh, you talked about Alan Capro and Dieter Roth, who had a big influence on you. But uh, what was the influence of John Balasari on you? Or did he did he have an influence? I don't. Know. Uh, Baldessari. Yeah, Baldessari. Uh, I I didn't know Baldessari very well uh, until the uh, well I knew of Baldessari's work and um, I I was always interested in his work but I don't think his work uh, was an influence in a real way on me. Uh, But I was interested in his work. You know. At that time, the artists like Baldessari and Rupersberg and Ed Ruscha and that type of uh, conceptualism of L.A. I was interested in, but uh, I was interested in other artists more. So, uh, but I've always respected his work. You know. you know, Paul told me a great story that when Arte Povera, the book, came out, he bought it with a friend and they split it because it was too expensive. So half yeah. had a half of the book. Yeah. And they would um, read it halfway through. And it was a timeshare book. Yeah, yeah, it was a timeshare book. I don't know what was in the other half. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe if we get the last question or last two questions. No. I can't hear me either. Okay. Um, it's very straightforward. Your, your work is full of sex and cocks and fetishistic materials, and I want to know what you find interesting about sex. There, it's straightforward. You, what you find interesting about sex? In your work. In your work. Not like I'm apart from it. What I find interesting about sex in my work? <laughs> yes. Ah. <laughs> uh. I don't know. Um, it, um, I, I, I think um, it's, it's that the subject of sex in my work is it goes back. I was really interested in uh, in um, in in the '60s in Reiki and therapy, and so and I was really influenced by I think uh, this book, uh, the Mass Psychology of Fascism, and um, it, it, so there's that part that it, it's sort of like oh yeah, there's the answer. I believe this one, and. Um, And then at the same time, uh, that this the thing of um, there's an early sculpture I made in 1970, which is they were made in the same room, and I, I didn't connect. I connected them, but I didn't realize how kind of critical it was. I had I had made this videotape in which I there were swinging doors. In my in this studio, I had like uh, these big swinging doors, and I I covered the inside of the doors that swung with uh, cotton, and then it was taped to the door, like cotton was wrapped and then taped, so that you ended up with this door that had this big white uh, cotton uh, entrance. That so when it hit. And it, 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 it kind of it was about making the doors quiet, but it was really about making this image of uh, of uh, like, a, like a, a, a vagina or a, like an opening like this vagina going like this. And then at the same time, uh, that same day or week, I taped a big stick to the wall, like a just a. Stick You know, took t gaffer's tape and taped it to the wall, and um, the two things of the vagina in the room that you went through, and the stick hanging off the wall, this dick, and and uh, that those two imagery have 
gone through my work all ever since. The, the pole uh, as the dick and uh, a lot of pieces there's swinging doors and the swinging doors are the doors or the vaginas and, and this kind of combination going back and forth. And then, and then sculptures now in which holes are dug out and uh, the hollowing out and making the hole and then the protruding pipe and the, and the stick. And then at the same time, it's a, there's a lot of imagery about the, the, the placid penis, that it's not erect, and that it's uh, this kind of uh, impotent, the impotent dick, and then the erect weapon, and then uh, the hole. And it reappears all the time. It's been there since uh, the 60s, and um, it's in all through the work, and uh, uh, is, uh, it's like I said, I, I'm not cured. I just obsess on it all the time. You know, and um, in relation to Pig Island, I can say it's also a lot about consumption. You know, I always yeah. thought that in Italian, also in English, you say a wedding is consumed or cons you say it's consumed, right? Yeah. And I always thought it's a creepy word choice to say that a marriage is consumed. It's a, it's a form of consumption. And in Pig Island particularly, there is this sort of equation between uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken boxes, sex, yeah. celebrity. And, um, you know, coming from Italy where my prime minister manages to consume our wealth, <laughs> accumulate wealth for himself, and consume various marriages. Yeah. I think that piece also resonates quite um, interestingly with you know, sex as a currency or sex as a form of consumption. Um, and uh, you know, after all, also the, the, the mechanics of celebrities are all based on uh, our desire of sex with them, but frustration of that desire. So I think it's also, um, you know, very much related also to a tradition of sex in the work of Duchamp. I think and sex as hydraulics, in a way, no? Yeah, like pumps it, and tubes and. Uh, you know, over the years, it's it, other layers have happened in how I associate, like, uh, like the pig humping over and over again, and then consumption over and over again, like this, the same gesture. And uh, so I connect the two. And the, the ingredients of ketchup and mayonnaise and liquid and the bottle being phallic and, uh, you know, uh, not just that the, it's, it's different than pop to me. It, it, it the psychology of advertising or the psychology of uh, consumer objects and, and uh, making something, you know, it, it finds itself connected. Like humping a mayonnaise bottle with a ketchup bottle is different than a Campbell's soup can on, uh, as a sculpture. Was a question there also? Hello? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm actually more concerned, uh, interested in, in your ideas of completion. In what? Uh, completion. Completion. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the, the process and sort of these performative aspects and all the detritus you see in your completed sculptures. And your sculptures never really look completed. They, they always look in flux. You have your coffee cups and you're mixing tubes and everything on the table and just you know, cover it up and, and I, they look like almost never completed. And I, I'm just curious of your, uh, of your uh, take on completion of a work, completion of a sculpture. Is it complete? Is it, will it ever be complete? And thank yeah. you. Uh, it, pieces do seem to just, I know that like in performances or something, there's just a point where it just ends. It just seems to be going and then all of a sudden it just, the end just happens. It just feels like there's nothing else, like the air's out of the bag 
and um, and then and I kind of know that with sculptures, it works the same. The air is out of the bag. It just sort of comes to an end. Uh, what's interesting to me is, is that sometimes a piece will go on for a long time, 10, 15 years. And then what's also interesting is sometimes the, the air is out of the bag, it's over, and then all of a sudden, with, is in the way that I didn't see the air coming out of the bag, I then all of a sudden don't see that it's starting to fill back up. And two years later, I'm back on the piece. So it, it changes my view of when something is completed. And I, I don't, uh, you know, like, uh, things seem to start back up. And uh, pieces sometimes feel like they never end even though they stop for a while, then start again. So that's maybe a good place where to end yeah. this. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> you back. Thank you. It wasn't too bad. I said it wasn't too bad. No, no, it's very good. Get this you fend it off some good questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. He was a nice uh...